how the sort of uh, cancers develop. So it's not just about obesity, just like you can smoke forever and not get lung cancer, but right. it raises your risk. So same what? as the rest of it, we actually know very little about. So we need to know more right. about those because uh, certain things, so smoking and diet are probably your biggest factors. And then there's a whole, there's like a hundred different uh, other risk factors for cancer. These are the other carcinogens that we talk about, but also things such as, you know, background radiation and sun exposure, you know, like if you get too mm -hmm. much sun, for example. So there's all sorts of other things and genetics plays a role, but one of the big mistakes I think we made is that we focus so much on the genetics part of it, thinking that, well, this is sort of a random mutation that mm. causes cancer, not sort of which puts the puts the onus on sort of this random luck uh, sort of uh, idea that it's just bad luck. Some people think that that's sort of a death sentence. Like if you take BRCA, which is a certain type of gene, for example. So what's the difference, even though you have the same genes, what's the difference between those two situations? And it comes down to the lifestyle. So the point about cancer is that cancer is like a seed. So if you have the genetics, you have the propensity to develop cancer. And this seed of cancer actually exists in all of our cells. And actually not just all our cells, but in all multicellular animals have that sort of seed of cancer. So what's important then is you can't do anything about the seed, but what you can do something about is the soil, which is that if you provide a fertile sort of soil for that seed to germinate, then you are going to increase your risk of developing this cancer and cancer is not a rare disease i mean it affects like one in ten of us one in eight of us something like that so it's something that we really have to think about as we live longer because it is one of these really important things but the trend is very clear because if you look at the uh you know the, the biggest killers of americans it's always been heart disease and cancer. So if you go back sort of to the 70s, so 50 years ago, you look at heart disease, number one killer of Americans, that's heart attacks, strokes, that kind of thing. Cancer was a fairly distant second, but the rate of death from heart disease has been improving very, very quickly. And the rate of improvement for cancer has been improving very, very, very It's It's because cancer is a very complex disease and the way we, think about cancer, we just don't know what it is. So for such a common disease, it's a total mystery why we get this cancer. Because if you think about it, it doesn't make any sense for cancer to develop because it's actually part of us. That is, if you develop breast cancer or colon cancer, for example, that cancer cell was initially derived from our own natural cells. So what, why would it want to do this <laughs> that is if you get cancer then the cancer grows and then it kills you and it kills itself so why would this sort of thing ever develop it doesn't make any sense from a sort of uh that that looking at it that way so the point about cancer is that we have never sort of understood what this is as a disease that is if you look at heart disease Heart disease is caused by blockages in arteries. So we develop all kinds of things. So we develop drugs, we develop blood thinners, we develop, you know, you go in and you use a balloon to open up the artery. Uh, you develop uh, new technologies such as imaging technologies. You develop ways to monitor patients. So because you know what causes it, because if you don't know what causes something, it's really hard to fix. Like if you have a car and all you hear is a random clank and you don't know what the clanking is from, it's really hard to fix it. Same thing with diseases. If you have a disease like COVID, for example, and you know it's a virus, well, now at least you have somewhere that you can start. That is, okay, it's a virus, let's develop a vaccine or let's develop some antiviral drug. But if you have no idea what this disease actually is, then you have nowhere to go. So that's what I talk about is how, how, we, to, how we think about cancer, the paradigm of cancer as a disease, what causes it. You have to first understand what it is. And that's been the real mystery. The medical mystery is what is cancer? And the, the way we look at cancer has changed significantly over the last 10 years. Right. And most people don't even understand that. So it's a very interesting story from that standpoint. Because the thing is that if you, like once you have the cancer, it's really hard because that's sort of like, you know, if you, 
if you don't change the oil in your car, then your car breaks down. Then you say, oh, I'm going to start changing the oil in my car. Well, yeah, that's good. But you need you know, a lot more than that. It's the same thing. Once you actually develop the cancer, then it's really hard to fix from a diet standpoint. You really need the drugs that we've spent, you know, millions and billions of dollars developing over these last 30 years. But in terms of preventing cancer, there's actually no reason why you couldn't because you can look at sort of people who live in a traditional society, for example. So you can take a look at, say, the Inuit or the American Indians sort of before, before sort of they became westernized. And, or you can look at the African people before they're sort of assimilated into a Western culture. And interestingly, those, those uh, peoples were actually considered, some of them were considered immune to cancer. There really? was so little cancer that they thought that the Inuit, for example, or what used to be called the Eskimos, actually could not get cancer. So the university, Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, they used to send an expedition up to the Arctic Circle every year to study why these, these Inuit couldn't get cancer. Of course, as they became westernized and started eating you know, sugar and white flour, then they started getting all the same cancers that we did. In Africa, for example, this, this fellow by the name of Denis Burkett, who is a sort of uh, a missionary and, and doctor, when he got down there, he's like, wow, in my, he, he was like, look at these, the difference, the, the people who live traditionally in Africa get no cancer, no colon cancer. But the minute they transition to a Western style civilization with their foods, with their, that, you know, the whole thing, they actually start to get cancer. You don't find cancer when, when that. So it, it, it was called actually a disease of civilization. So all of these diseases, obesity, diabetes, and cancer were not found in people living traditionally. So the point is, not that, you know, one is that they didn't live as long, but the point is that if you can find and understand what makes it, you know, protective from them, why the soil, sort of soil, like we all have to see that the soil was different. What it is about that, if we can understand that, then you can, you can, you can reduce your risk substantially to the point where your, you know, your risk is very low. Um, again, as an example, if you take a Japanese or Chinese woman from Japan or from Shanghai and you move them to San Francisco, within a couple of generations, the risk of breast cancer approximately triple. So it's crazy, exactly, but that's great hope. And, and remember, Shanghai and Japan and so on, they're, they're, you know, modern societies. So if you can understand what it is about the, the diet, about the lifestyle, that's so important, you could actually take that woman in San Francisco and reduce her risk of breast cancer by a third. So that's very, very powerful knowledge. Yeah, I think that's a good question. And it's um, sort of sugar is probably one of the very, very important things that we really need to lower because that really supports it. And it gets to how cancer develops. Uh, a lot of the refined foods and people talk and, and the most that we eat, like the, the one thing we eat more than anything else tends to be refined carbohydrates. Um, so, you know, white bread and that kind of thing. That's probably the most important thing uh, is the sugar and refined uh, grains. Refined anything is probably bad for you. So, it, you know, even if you're not talking about carbohydrates, but refined, say, oils, you should eat natural oils, like eat eat foods that are sort of in the natural state and refined uh, meats, like, um, you know, it's, you know, eating bologna, for example. People talk about meat all the time, but it's like, there's a big difference between bologna <laughs> and, you know, grass-finished beef sort of yeah. thing. It's, there's a huge difference because one is jam-packed full of chemicals and other crap, uh, and one is just beef, right? And people have been eating beef for thousands of years. So those refined foods are refined carbs, but also refined fats and refined proteins. Probably those play a decent role, although the evidence is lower. And then the other thing that is really important, the fifth thing that's probably very important is likely uh, the frequency that we eat. That is, eating all the time provides that 
sort of fertile soil. So, so to understand why this is, you have to get back to sort of how cancer develops. So you have to understand that cancer almost develops, evolves almost as a separate species from us. So when you have a uh, breast cancer cell, for example, it originated from a normal breast cell, but after it evolves, it, it, it grows or doesn't grow depending on growth factors. And it's a, almost a separate species from us. That is, it will grow and it won't, the normal breast cell or a normal lung cell, they will do everything to, you know, play on the team, right? So they're always supporting the body. Right. You're part, you're a team player. Those cancer cells are not team players. Basically, they're out for themselves. But, but that's the point that this cancer cell now is only interested in its own survival. That is, it will grow and it will grow at the expense of its neighbor. So it will keep growing and it will destroy everything around it. So it will move around, for example. So a breast cancer cell will move around the body. Mm. And that's not for the good of the whole body, right? It's for the good of itself. It's trying to spread itself around. So you got to realize that the, 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 the cancer cell responds as a foreign organism. And it sounds very strange to say, okay, we have this foreign organism, almost like an infection in us, but that's actually how our body sees that cancer. Mm -hmm. That is our, our immune system actually detects, it's a very powerful, um, you know, it, it kills stuff, but it's very powerful. So it has to be reined in because you don't want it destroying, you know, normal parts of the body. So it recognizes certain cells as foreign and certain cells as self. And cancers are actually innately uh, seen as foreign cells. So it is a foreign invader almost that has evolved from us. But during uh, the development of this cancer, it will grow or not grow depending on growth signals. So our body has certain nutrient sensors. So nutrient sensors tells our body when food is available. So when you eat, certain, certain hormones like insulin and mTOR will go up. And that tells our body that food is available, we should grow, right? Because you don't want your cells to grow when there's no food, right? It's just natural. Mm -hmm. If there's no food, you got to get rid of some of those extraneous cells. So if you have, if you're eating all the time and you're always, you're always activating these nutrient sensors, you're actually telling your body, grow, 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 grow. So if you eat six, eight times a day, you're telling your body, your cells in your body, grow, 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 grow. If you eat fewer times, like three times a day, or you do intermittent fasting, if you don't eat at all, what you're going to do is shut down to those growth signals and the cancer will have a diff more difficult time to grow. So if you grow breast cancer cells in the lab, for example, you can't do it without insulin. It will actually wither up and die. But the point is that if you don't eat like fasting, for example, one is you're going to lower your insulin levels, which will you know, lower the growth, overall growth signaling in our body, which is a good thing for adults. And adults' growth is not good. Generally, you, you'd stay the same size. You don't want to be growing too much because the, you know, growth, um, a high growth environment, of course, lets the cancer sort of grow out of control. And that was the secret to why vitamins, for example, was not a good thing because it's basically growth. It's, it's, it supports growth of cells. And what they found in a lot of studies was when they gave people these vitamin supplements, they actually got more cancer. They didn't get less cancer, they got more cancer. So in fact, it's just like if you spray, spread fertilizer on an empty field, you want the grass to grow, but what grows are a bunch of weeds because you've put down all this growth signaling uh, stuff. So therefore all you get is the weeds. There's no evidence that it's really bad for you. When you give high doses in these studies, you do get certain ones, so folic acid, for example, and beta carotene, which is a precursor to vitamin A. And those two studies, there is actually a, a suggestion that you actually get more cancer from them. Because in our current situation in North America, most of us are not vitamin deficient. Most of us actually have too much. You actually want to slow down the growth intimately linked with cancer is because both conditions are conditions where we have too much insulin in our body. And, and, and there's several ways to do that. One is to change either the foods that you eat, and that is the sugar, for example, the refined carbohydrates that make up the bulk of our diet. And the other thing is to change the frequency with which you eat, because you can affect both things so just like if you're for example to pay you know ten dollars and you pay it every day it adds up quickly 
monthly, right? If you have a coffee every day and it's like, you know, five or seven bucks at Starbucks, every day, every day, every day, it adds up. So just like that, it's not just the amount that you're paying, which is not much, but it's the frequency, right? Same thing with the foods. It's not just the, the amount that you eat or what it is that you eat, it's how often you eat it. So if you're eating now six, eight times a day, well, that's a lot worse if you ate once a day, right? That's just basic math. Like you can't yeah. get around that. And the problem is, of course, that if you look at how people eat today compared to sort of 1970, it's very different. So in 1970, people ate three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. No snacks. Nobody ate snacks back then. And people say it's good for you. People say, oh, you should eat multiple times in the day, six times a day. It's good for you. But nobody in the history of humanity has done that before because we had work to do, right? It's not like your great grandparents, you know, working in the factory, they're taking off every two hours to make themselves a little, you know, ham sandwich or something, right? It was like, there's work to do. You eat when you have time. So, you know, in the 70s, it's funny because I always say you have breakfast, lunch and dinner and that was it. If you wanted an after-school snack, your mom said, no, you're going to ruin your dinner. And if you wanted a bedtime snack, she would have said, no, you should have ate more at dinner. 